What's up, y'all? Happy Easter week, Holy week. I'm so pumped to introduce you to this week's guest. Molly Stillman is an author, podcaster, um, wife, mom, farmer, decade-long comedian. She is hilarious. She is passionate. She is faithful. And she has just released her first book today, If I Don't Laugh, I'll Cry is a perfect title for who she is, for what she does, for her story. And we just have an incredible conversation. She walks us through a lot of her crazy, blessed, broken childhood, um, how learning to deal with that well and not well led her to striving for purpose and identity and meaning and stability and just about everything but the Lord and how that led her to rock bottom in just about every facet of her life. Um, how her now husband, who was her <laughs> not boyfriend, as she calls him, that they were just friends for so long, led her right to Jesus almost by accident, um, just by being who he was and just by the sheer circumstances of of hardship that she was in. And she's got an incredible testimony that's just real and raw and, and is an invitation for anybody to, at rock bottom, really ask themselves a hard question like, what isn't working and why isn't it working? And could Jesus work to get me out of this? Um, she is such an incredible person. We had a blast. We like laughed way more than we probably should have. I feel like we were kind of sisters separated at birth. This was such a treat to have her this week. Like I said, we laugh a lot. We joke a lot. We go real deep um, on Easter week. And so I'm just really excited to have Molly. And I know y'all will be really excited to get to know her. So enjoy this episode this week with my new friend, Molly Stillman. Molly, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Um, it's the week of Easter that this is coming out. It is also the day of your debut book release. So first and foremost, congratulations. That is a Thank huge you. deal. Thank you. I'm so excited. Uh, and it's like fun to think about the fact, you know, I mean, when we're recording this, it's in advance, but it's like, all right. Okay. We're doing this. We're like, we're down to the wire. So yeah. thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really honored to be here. Well, I'm so grateful to have you. I feel like as I obviously read your book and then was sort of like, you know, diving into your whole life. Um, <laughs> I just feel like we have so many similarities. I am a very amateur self-proclaimed golfer. You're an actual Love good me. golfer. <laughs> I just feel like Love that's me. limited um, in our female community. So I'm yes. hyped about that. Yes. Um, you had a creative writing major. You say you're actually an introvert. Our initials are the same. I'm just like, are we long lost sisters somewhere? So are. that's how I feel toward you to start this whole conversation. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I think we are. So, um, I mean, if you b have multiple beverages, like where you are currently sitting right now, like I have multiple yes. beverages, then we are the same. <laughs> <laughs> yes, every day. It's it's is it coffee? Is it kombucha? Is it sparkling? Is it still like we don't know, but there's always <laughs> options. It's, it's always. It is options for part. My husband always laughs at me. He's like, because my husband drinks room temperature water. That's mm, like it. That's the only thing that he ingests is room temperature water. And meanwhile, I'm like so bougie where I'm like, oh, yeah. I need my nugget ice with a fresh lime and my Topo Chico or <laughs> yes. Diet Coke. And I have like a hierarchy of Diet Cokes that I drink. Like fountain is key. Uh, glass bottle is second. Uh, can is third and way, 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 way down is plastic. And so, I mean, it's, it, you know, anyway, <laughs> nobody really came here for my reviews of beverages, but that is the truth. <laughs> I think we did here in the South diet Coke should be structured within a hierarchy and you've really just laid 100%. it out for us. So. And then for people that are real diet Coke aficionados, they know that there's also a hierarchy within fountain diet Coke places so like mcdonald's is number one for diet coke mm -hmm. and chick-fil-a is number two and then my local circle k gas station is number three <laughs> strong endorsement for the circle k <laughs> circle k. um is mcdonald's the actual beverage diet coke or is it the straw i've heard a lot of um arguments beverage. for the straw okay it's the beverage yeah okay and i don't even eat mcdonald's food but i will go through a drive through just That's to awesome. pay a dollar eight for a fountain diet coke from okay. mcdonald's your listeners are like what is this lady 
No, we have already gotten more than we paid for here. So this this conversation is complete. Um, uh, besides the beverage uh, rundown, we do yeah. love to start just with something fun. We're all about joy yeah. on the show. And love it. like I said, I'm in Nashville, um, kind of grew up around country music. So music brings me joy. And I want to know mm -hmm. for you, Molly, um, if you had like a walkout song for your life, like a song playing behind you, right, in your own montage right now, uh, what would that be? I love this question because I always ask people that too, where I'm like, if you were you like, like a baseball player, not, Th not, that's on, it. I don't ask this on my podcast. I just ask it of my friends in real life <laughs> where I go, like, if you were a baseball player and like, what is your walkout song? I love this question. Yes. We are the um, same. Okay. So legitimately it would, it has changed over the years. And this does not mean that this is like my favorite music while I love this band, but I think my walkout song would be Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. Stop me now. I'm having such a good time. I'm having a ball. Don't oh, stop me I love it. Now. I love a throwback answer. That's fantastic. Yeah. Don't stop me because I'm having a good time. Yes. Having a good time. You are shooting stars. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just saying, like, I think that that would be a really fun walkout song. No, that's fantastic. And a total joy anthem, which right. we love. Exactly. And exactly. you can you can sing. So that was very refreshing. When I do it, it doesn't turn out exactly like that. Um, well, I love it. That's that's definitely your vibe walking into this spring with your book. I'm so excited. Yeah. The book title uh, is called If I Don't Laugh, I'll Cry, which is amazing. Um, How Death, Debt, and Comedy Led to a Life of Faith, Farming, and forgetting what I came in this room for, which is so funny. Um, so it comes out today. Yes. Um, not only that, but you've had your podcast, Can I Laugh on Your Shoulder? Also amazing title. Um, and a blog that goes with it for, I mean, well over a decade. This has sort mm -hmm. of been your message. And yeah. uh, part of why I'm really excited to have you is, like I said, the show's about joy and you just, you just seem to emanate joy. Like this is our first meeting, you know, not online, um, researching, but I can feel that from you and, and just sort of the radiance of you as a person. And, and I wonder, is that just like your natural disposition? Um, was that sort of hard won for you in ways? I mean, I sort of know that cause I read your book, but, but, yeah. but give the, re or the um, listener a little back. I would say, yes, it is my natural disposition. Um, but I would say like, as far as my personality goes, and we're going to get real deep real quick. So yes, it is my natural disposition while also the source of it and the genuineness of it has been more hard fought. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think part of it is, you know, I just, w from the time I came out of the womb, like I just always had a big personality, um, you know, always was just, I loved to make people laugh. And, you know, I mean, I was voted class clown when I was in high school. So like, I mean, that was, um, you know, that from an early age, that was just kind of who I was. And then of course, like, you know, doing, I did improv and sketch comedy for, um, a long time and really thought my goal and my dream and my vision and my calling in life was to be a comedian, um, not stand up. Uh, I did stand up once or twice and it just wasn't my jam. <laughs> um, and, uh, it was just, I really loved the spontaneity and the thrill of improv. Um, improv is so fun. Um, and then I love the creativity of sketch. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, on the outside, for sure, this has always been my personality. And, you know, when I when I named my blog and my Instagram handle, you know, is still being Molly, I changed it um, or I branded that back in 2012. And um, I had, uh, I mean, I'd been in the content creation space already for a long time at that point. Um but I had become a believer in the fall of 2010. And so, you know, I'd started following Christ and, um, and that is where I really found my true source of joy. And that is where like, I found the difference between the fleetingness of happiness, mm -hmm. um, that is more circumstantial versus like what true unadulterated joy is. And, um, and so, as I began to, you know, that, that painful process of sanctification, that like real churchy word, but the painful necessary process of sanctification, as I 
was following Jesus for the first time in my adult life, um, I realized that while I was changing, I mean, I'm a, you know, the person that wrote this book and the person that is talking with you today, like is a vastly different night and day person than the person I was prior to 2010. Um, however, like I'm still Molly, like that's the whole, like, (laughs) I'm still being Molly. Like I'm still, I'm still the like, funny I still like act crazy and do stupid dance moves and like you know what I mean like and just that that is my personality so I think there's a difference in helping people understand that like you can change but like God hardwired my personality Mm. to be this way like my disposition has been always what it has (laughs) is not really gonna change um and I think that that's something that that um I now understand later in life with more hindsight and spiritual maturity, um, than I maybe did pr- previously. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate you saying that because I think obviously this idea again, to deep dive, like in scripture that we are a new creation in Christ, like that right. is one of the most hopeful things I can personally read, I think, and remind myself of is like everything that I'm carrying, everything that I don't want to see in the mirror about me, God is refining and, mm-hmm. and I am becoming a new creation. But as you said, like the gifts and the flaws kind of that he hardwired into me are not only not a mistake, they are things that when we do in your case completely, you know, in a salvific way, also it's ridiculous church term, but when we are saved and turning to God, he redeems those and makes them even more beautiful. Right. Um, But also just when we actively daily commit to walk with him, he makes those things beautiful and just, you know, none of us are a mistake in any way. We're so intentional. Um, and so I love that that's sort of your, your branding is I'm still Molly, like all that's there yeah. and yeah. it is from God. And a lot of what I know now from reading your book about you, um, is that a lot of that is from your parents and your family too. Um, yeah. I just, I feel like, I feel like I know them or want to know them from reading your book, a, a huge portion of it, um, is before you came to Christ, actually mm-hmm. most of the book, yeah, most of the book um, is. Yeah. which I'm curious to know why um and also just for the for the listeners who haven't read it yet because it comes out today can you give us like a little paint a little picture give us a little color of your parents in your childhood because i think that is crucial in kind of setting up your story and who you are and yeah. what you went through i just like want to be friends with oh <laughs> <laughs> i know you're the best my dad's gonna be 80 this year and Amazing. he is 100 percent like still yeah that's he is who he is yeah. um well, to answer your first question as far as like why. Mm. So it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I wanted to write a book for a really long time. And um, it really wasn't until the last decade or so that the the this book began, began to be more clear that this is what I was supposed to write. And um, I'm going to give some insight. I like, I like this question because no one has asked me this question. Um, and I, it was really intentional. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I first, I st- first started working on the proposal for this book back in the summer of 2017. So okay. this, this has been a long time yeah. coming. Um, and then I, you know, refined and edited and refined and then a pandemic hit and all the things. And then in the fall of 2021, I really was like, okay, this is, we're making this happen. And so then I was like, I need to find an agent. So I sent it to three, I sent the proposal to three different agencies. One never responded to me. One um, I interviewed with, and it was just really clear that she didn't understand what I was trying to do with this book. Like she was kind of like, I like the proposal, but I actually think you need to write a different book. <laughs> and I was like, mm, thanks, no no. thanks or no thanks. <laughs> and then the third person, like who is my agent was like, I love this. Like this is needed. And, you know, this is the book that you should write. And I was like, yes, exactly. (laughs) Um, and then, you know, then we, you submit to publishers and all that kind of stuff. And anyway, um, when I finally signed with my publisher and, and I, you know, sent them that, you know, I had an outline and all of that stuff. Um, one of the conversations that I had had was, you know, the reality is, is I wrote this book for, you know, I, I would love everyone to read it. (laughs) And I think it's a great book (laughs) and I really truly believe in it. Um, and for people listening, I would love right now for you to to buy this book and be great and read it. Um, or the audio book because I read it and it's, it's really fun. Um, but you know, I wrote it for yes, believers, 
Um, but like in the writing world, there's this term that I actually really don't like, but I don't have a different term for it, but like your avatar. Yeah. So this person is like your avatar is who is the person that you are writing for? Um, and so I had three particular people in mind. I will not say their names just in case. I don't think that they will because they're, they're not believers, <laughs> okay. but you know, just in case. And yeah. so there are three pe particular people that I had in mind that I thought of reading my words. Um, and it's because they don't know Jesus. And the whole goal of it is I really wanted people to understand the trajectory that my story took in that, like, here is my, here's my life. Here is my brokenness. And like, here is how I hit rock bottom. And here is what Jesus did. Yeah so that they can see their own story in it mm. so that when they close the book, like I was basically like, I want them to laugh. I want them to cry. I want them to go on this emotional roller coaster with yeah. me. And then I want to have earned the right by the end of the book to punch them in the face with the gospel. Like yeah. <laughs> I used yeah. that terms a few times with my editor. I was like, I want the last chapter or two to be a smack you in the face gospel message yeah. where you cannot close the book and not have heard the gospel. Mm. Um, and so that was really, really, really intentional because I was like, I know these people and I cannot tell them this last, I can't read this last chapter to them without having earned the right through mm -hmm. the first 21. Um, and so, and, and that, so that was really intentional in that, in that respect, because I want, I don't have this like idea that, <laughs> that like they're going to get saved while reading the book. Literally my entire goal was that they would close the book and go, Hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 This Jesus thing isn't so weird. Yeah. Um, but then on the flip side, like I also wrote it for people who have walked with Jesus, maybe their whole lives and like maybe see those who are far from God in a different light. Um, so it was kind of, I had these two things in mind, but that was, that whole thing was really intentional. And then it's interesting. Um, and most of the, I would say 95% of the early reviews of the book have all been like incredibly positive, but you know, there's always negative Nancy's out there. Sure. And one of the negative reviews I got was like, if I'd have known that the last 20% of this book was just going to be Christian <laughs> proselytizing, like I would never have read it. And I was just like, okay, well the book's not for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that was maybe more information than you were actually interested, but like I, I love talking about that because it really was yeah. super intentional. No, I, I am so thankful to hear you say that. That's definitely the impression you get as a reader. It's, it's never, even, even with the gospel smack at the end, like it's not a preachy thing. It's no, like, man, yeah. here's my story. Like you said, right. here's rock bottom in a whole lot of different ways and me chasing what I thought was stability and completeness and identity yeah. and all this stuff in a whole lot of different ways. And here's how it didn't work every yeah. time. Yeah. And here's the one thing that worked and it's just very authentic. And I think obviously your kind of bend toward comedy is always an invitation. It's an easier invitation for people. And so that's just fun. Like I will say, it's just a fun read. I feel like I got to know you a lot. Like your voice comes through really well. Like I said, I feel like I kind of was in your childhood with you and stuff. And so I hope I hope that your hopes come through to readers with this book in that yeah. if you're like me and you grew up in the church and also went through really hard stuff yeah. and didn't do things right, that you see your story reflected in that and feel camaraderie with you. But even still, if you're not, or there are people, you know, like your three avatars that you're like, man, I just don't know. Like, I wish they would hear this yeah. to know that, man, this is an invitation. Like, this is a story that is everybody's story, you know, exactly. somehow. Exactly. That was the whole goal was like, it's through the lens of yes, I'm sharing mine, but helping people understand that this is all of our stories. Like yeah. when we are um, blessed to live long enough uh, to experience life, like we are going to experience suffering and joy and grief and sorrow and celebration and pain. And like, um, we're going to make stupid choices. We're going to make mistakes. Like all of it is the human experience. Um, but there is hope. And, and like you said, you know, yeah, even if you did grow up in the church, like you're still going to screw up. Like yeah. it's just, <laughs> we all are. And it's not, you're not hopeless. It's, you're not there. There's, there's no, um, 
you you can't there's nothing that cannot be redeemed mm. by God. Um and I'm really glad that you said that it doesn't that that last chapter didn't sound preachy because that was also the goal is like I wanted it to be genuine and authentic and um and I, I feel like I did that well and um and and honestly it's not from and I, I not don't want to over spiritualize this but it was not of me. Um in yeah. fact a uh, fun little fact is my manuscript was due January 13th of 2023. And as of January 12th, I still didn't have a last chapter. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I remember I was, my husband was like, what are you going to do? Like, you haven't yeah. finished your, you're gonna just going to stay up all night. And I was like, I don't know. Like, I just have been trusting that God is going to like, give me the words. And I went to Bible study that morning and, uh, like there was one line that was said in the lecture and I like in that moment, I was like, Oh my gosh, I know exactly what I'm supposed to write. And so I went, I got home from Bible study and I sat down on my computer and I typed out that chapter in an hour and a half. And That's when amazing. I tell you like most of the book, you know, has changed and we edited yes. and stuff like the last chapter almost had no edits. Like That's it's amazing. almost exactly. And I can tell you like from writing the previous 21 <laughs> chapters, like that is That's not, that is like unusual. a God thing all the way is like yeah. he was like the he the holy spirit was just like pouring out the oh, words yeah. and i was like thank 100%. you jesus um and it was exactly what i you know had had hoped and prayed it would be so, so anyway takeaway from molly if you procrastinate god yeah, will do just, the work for you, you just, yeah, you just <laughs> procrastinate till the absolute uh, last minute. Um, oh man yeah. that's so funny. and then i still turned in my manuscript a day early so <laughs> get it girl yeah you got it you finished yes, the race you did um, it well, will you give uh, listeners a little bit um, of sort of that journey to the rock bottom that you talked about? Like, you don't have to, it's the whole book. I don't want you to give away the book. I want them to read your story. But particularly yeah. kind of where this started with you um, was everything that you went through as a teenager with your mom. Will you give us sort of some background on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess that was kind of the second part of your other question is just, you know, like about my childhood and all that. So yeah, the, the, um, you know, the, the short gist of it is, um, I grew up in a home with two incredible parents who were, um, recovering alcoholic Irish Catholics. And, uh, so if anybody like knows anything about one recovering alcoholics or two Irish Catholics, like there's just not, it's, it's a very unfiltered home to grow up. <laughs> yeah. in. There's not a whole lot that is sh shielded from. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, and also one of them happens to be uh, my mom uh, happens to be a war veteran. So um, needless to say, like language was not really <laughs> filtered yeah. in my house. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, life was not filtered. Um, but uh, there was a lot of laughter. Uh, it was a loud family. Um, but, uh, a beautiful family. My parents met later in life. Um, they were not their first marriages. My dad was actually, my mom was my dad's third marriage. Um, my mom was my dad's second or my dad was my mom's second marriage. Um, and, uh, they got married six weeks after their first date. Um, and they were, you know, if you believe in soulmates, I could argue that my yeah. parents were soulmates. Um, and, uh, so my mom, uh, served as an army nurse in, during the Vietnam war from 1969 to 1970. And, um, you know, the Vietnam war was a very unpopular war in, um, our country's history. Not that any wars are popular, but it was especially divisive. Um, and so when my mom returned home, you know, she didn't return home to this, country that like had welcome home signs and and flowers and brass bands and parades and all of that it was um you know she was spit on she was called a baby killer she was feces was thrown on her um there was no resources um and then especially on top of that not just being a vietnam veteran which was unpopular but being a female vietnam veteran was this added layer of of challenge because um, she would even go to the VA, um, the Veterans Affairs Office, and she would walk in, she would try to get resources, and she would be told to her face, oh, I'm sorry, we can't do that because women didn't serve in NOM. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was like her existence, her service had been basically completely erased and denied. And um, so she fell into patterns of alcoholism and depression, um, had a hard time keeping down a job. And... Um, you know, she got married and it was a um, pretty tumultuous marriage, not abusive, just, um, you know, she was a drunk and yeah. depressed and yeah. um, it was, it was just a recipe for disaster. 
Um, and, uh, so fast forward, uh, you know, I, my parents met, they get married. I'm born, uh, within a year. And, um, this also was a time. So my mom's memoir, which was really a journey of her healings. She got sober in 83. And at the same year, she also released her memoir home before morning, um, which was the first nonfiction account of the war from a woman's perspective. And so it was this incredible, I mean, it was immediately like it was a bestseller and um, received all this acclaim, but also incredibly divisive. Mm. And so you had kind of two camps of people. One camp was, thank you for telling this story, honestly, and thank you for, you know, helping people understand what really happened in Vietnam. And then you had this other camp who was essentially in denial and was like, we don't agree with anything you've written. This is all lies. Like you're just trying to sell books. Um, an entire organization was created to basically discredit her, call her, you know, her ethics into question. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a mess. And, um, so she really, I mean that it, it nearly bankrupted my parents, um, the, you know, going through these legal battles and, and all of these things. And then they've just gotten married. <laughs> you know, they brought a child into a world, yeah. into the world. And so it's like, how did their marriage survive? Like For they were sure. That's what I'm thinking. Eerily broke, uh, you know, like they're in court. And yeah. um, I mean, it was, but yet they're, it just strengthened their marriage. And then uh, fast forward to the fall of 1994. Uh, I was in fourth grade and my, we were re- modeling an area of our home. We grew up in this, I was growing up in this really, really old kind of turn of the century house that had like the horse hair plaster insulation oh, yeah. and all that stuff. Um, we were remodeling um, uh, the upstairs and um, within about 24 hours of that first demo, um, my mom ends up in um, pulmonary edema and she gets rushed to the emergency room and She's on a ventilator and, you know, fighting for her life. And um, we then proceed to spend the next uh, six-ish months um, going to different specialists and doctors, the Mayo Clinic, Johns Hopkins, you name it, VA. Um, and then we finally get sent out to this um, hospital in Denver where they diagnose her with... Um, a disease that only about four other people in the entire world had ever had. And wow. um, so she gets this, uh, she gets this diagnosis. Um, the doctors tell her basically she has two years to live. Um, they did not tell me this. Um, my parents kind of chose to keep that secret. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, then I'm now dealing with a chronically ill parent. <laughs> um, and if anybody's ever dealt with somebody with a chronic illness, um, you know that it just takes everything from you. Uh, financially, um, relationally, um, at nothing is the same. Um, nothing is normal. Um, not like things were normal before, but even more so. Um, and so, you know, from the ages of nine to 17, you know, I'm going through the most formative years of my life with this chronically ill parent. Um, but I, at the same time, like I, you know, I watched what it looked like for, uh, my father to care for my mother, like in sickness and in health for richer, for poorer. Like I saw what that, what love really looked like. Um, but you know, all the while, like I'm battling my own depression and, um, you know, really trying to figure out how to navigate this very bizarre like yeah. life situation that we find ourselves in. And then in November of 2017, um, my mom died and um, it was sudden and it was uh, excruciating and it was uh, emotional and it was, I mean, it was all the things. Um, <clears throat> and that really began the journey, I think, really accelerated my direction towards rock bottom where I just, I shut down. Um, I didn't, I didn't really want to deal with it. I didn't want to talk to anybody about it. Um, and so then I go off to college and, you know, I'm, I'm just, everything is great. Everything is great. You know, it's like one of those, like, I'm fine. Yeah. Everything is fine. We're yeah. all fine. <laughs> where I was very much not fine. I, nothing yeah. about me was fine, but I had the, I was just, primo at mm -hmm. looking like everything 
was fine. And um, then uh, <laughs> what do you what happens um, when on my 21st birthday is of like first second day of my senior year of college, I go and I get in the mail a check, a paper check for a quarter of a million dollars from wow. my mom's estranged family as an inheritance. Um, and that's a, you know, a long complicated story, but what happens when you give a depressed, emotional shutdown, <laughs> never been to therapy, uh, 21 year old, a quarter of a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Great things happen. Yeah, you um, saved, you invested. You yeah, thriving. it was great. Yeah. Totally. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so, and that really, really accelerated the trajectory southward. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so, you know, then within um, a span of about less than two years, I ended up over $36,000 in consumer credit card debt. Um, so I'd not only spent every dime that I got, but then some. Mm. Um, I was making 30 grand a year as a teacher. So, you know, I was in more debt than I made in a year. Yeah. And, um, but then even from there, hitting financial rock bottom in the summer of 2008, I mean, then it took another two years mm -hmm. for me to hit emotional, spiritual rock bottom, um, oh, wow. to where I, you know, I got to the point where I had been trying to, pick myself up by these, you know, non-existent mm -hmm. bootstraps where I'd been trying to, um, you know, cover up my sins. Mm -hmm. Um, and cause nobody knew what was going on. You know, I didn't tell anybody anything. I mean, I just had been hiding and I just had yeah. isolated myself. Um, and then, I mean, I got to the point where, I mean, I just would lay in bed. I lived by myself. I would lay in bed at night and I was just contemplating suicide. Mm -hmm. And when you get to that point where your thoughts are so dark, and everything is so dark. Um, you you ha you get to a point where you are either like I'm going to go through with this or I'm going to get help. Mm. Um, and for me, the process of getting help was simply asking the guy I was dating at the time, "Can I go to church with you?" <laughs> and um, and so that kind of uh, leads me to you know the rest is history. Um, from that point is where I stepped foot into the doors of a church and I heard the gospel message for the first time yeah. and. Um, it wasn't like, uh, I didn't raise my hand and surrender my life to Jesus in that moment, but it was a, I walked out of that church for the first time in my life with a glimmer of hope. Yeah. I love yours and John's story, your husband, John, <laughs> um, you write it so well in the book, just the whole way it started. Y'all work together, concert story, the hot tub story, like the whole thing. I, again, I feel like I was there, like you reiterate over and over. I'm not looking for a boyfriend. I'm not looking for a boyfriend. Like that you were talking for, you were like the original situation ship. Is that the term? Like, Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. It's just like, it, it's such a great story. And I, I, I appreciate it in the book. And I feel like this is a, this is something that I want a lot of people to hear. You, you say in the book, like you were leery of him because he was a Christian. Yeah. And at this point, as you said, you were like financial, relational, emotional, spiritual rock bottom. Um, but you were drawn to him. You said there was mm -hmm. something about him that just yeah, was irresistible. And, and I think that what a beautiful picture to see how you're like, as James says, it's like not your work, show your belief as in like legalism, but like, your work show your belief because the way you live can actually entice people yeah. to wonder why you live that way. And and right. that was the experience I saw kind of in y'all's dating. And, and yeah. I imagine is what led you to, can I go to church with you? Like, why did you know why you asked that question? At the time? No, I did not. Um, again, benefit of hindsight, looking back. Yeah. I think I just, I got into a point where, and again, at the time, like we weren't dating, We'd been hanging out for a few yeah. months all the time, like with nobody else, but, <laughs> but we weren't dating. We weren't boyfriend, yeah. girlfriend, you know? Um, but I think, yeah, I think there was, there was something about him that was, there was, um, he was, he has, and he's still to this day, he has this assuredness about himself, mm. this secure, um, uh, the security and it's not arrogance. Um, mm -hmm. although like some people joy, it would joke, uh, that it is, but it's not, it's not, it's, it's a, it is a, 
a firm foundation of his identity as a son of Jesus. Like mm-hmm. it is, and that is just who he is. And that has always been how he is. And um, I can see that like the fruit of how his parents raised him. Um, he just, he's a great example. And he always says like how he kind of struggles like on like when testimony days, when people tell, give testimonies. Cause he's like, I don't have a like gross, yeah. weird, messy testimonies. Yeah. Like I grew up in a home with two parents who loved each other and are still married. And, you know, uh, like, you know, and I went to sun, you know, church every Sunday and church every Wednesday and like yeah. youth group. And, and I was like, but that's a testimony. Like that's mm-hmm. what we want, right. As like Christian adults. And if you're in marriage and you're a parent, like that's what you want. You want your yeah. kids to grow up and to be, you don't want them like running off and being yeah. a prodigal. And, um, you know, so it, yeah, there was just this, there was that je ne sais quoi about him that was like, he, he just, he, um, you know, he kind of joked that, um, cause so we worked at this radio station that was, um, uh, in the Chapel Hill, uh, community. And, um, you know, if you know anything about North Carolina and Chapel Hill in particular, like North Carolina as a whole is like this pretty conservative Bible belt state, but like the, the university towns like Chapel Hill, Durham, like they're pretty like liberal, like, I mean, I just mean that in like a, they're, they look different demographically than the rest of the state. And so like WCHL is like this, uh, this radio, this talk radio station, the sports radio station, what we covered Carolina sports, but then also had on during the day, it was like these liberal talk shows. And, um, and, uh, but John always joked that he was like the token Republican on staff. So like, you know, it's just like everybody, on, and everybody loved like, you know, it just it wasn't like a bad thing. It was just like yeah. this was, you know, he's kind of like this conservative Christian, like amongst the rest of the staff that was just very different. And um, and uh, and, you know, it's it was a very also a very different political climate at the time um, where like in 2010, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah, John's a token yeah, Republican sure. on staff, yeah. you know, whatever. But there was something about him where he just like never he never felt like he needed to fall in line with what other people were doing. Like he mm-hmm. wasn't afraid to stand up and disagree or to go against the grain like um, he's just unwavered by yeah, what so other people say about him or or what other people do. Like he is just on his own track. And I just, I know now that it's like, it's just a lifetime of walking with Jesus, Mm. a lifetime of abiding in Christ where you're just going to look a little bit different than everybody else around you. And not in like a, he's not in a judgmental way. Like people love him. Um, you know, and, uh, and I could say so much more about that because everybody just loves him. Um, because he just has this magnetic personality. And, and like I said, when we were dating and I was just in such a different place, um, I could just tell, I was like, there's just something different about him and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Um, and I just wanted that. And so, um, you know, he would talk about going to church. He was never, he never shied away, but he didn't like evangelize me, Mm -hmm. but he never, yeah, he never shied away from talking about his faith and his upbringing and and anything like that. So I think it was, yeah, it's, it really goes into that that verse in James where it's just like he just lived it um, through his actions and through his um, through the way that he dealt with other people and his compassion and um, and his steadfastness. Yeah, I think I love how you describe him. I mean, from a faith standpoint and just from like just sheer adoration of how long y'all have been married. It's just <laughs> it's lovely to see. And I think it's important too, especially part of what I love, like I said, your book's coming out today, but I wanted to have you on this Holy Week, on Easter week, mm-hmm. um, for a lot of the things we've talked about. And I think like you kind of jokingly referenced like what friends of mine have called our boring testimonies, which is like really kind of what it is until, you know, mine obviously had a very tragic turn that now catches people's attention. But until that point, like, you know, I had the boring testimony too. And it's like, you don't maybe sometimes feel the value and the power in that. And when you describe, okay, no, it wasn't some like rags to riches or like tragic catastrophic prodigal Mm -hmm. son story, but your story still has the power to turn heads and say, like, why is that guy different? Like, why is he stable? Like what sets him apart? That's like, that's what God calls us. Like, I think it's sanctification. There's some word that means set apart in scripture. And that's what he wants us to do is like stand on our own and just that there's power in that. Like, I know there's just a lot of people who feel that way. So I think it's cool to hear you 
speak with such joy about, about his influence on your life and, and others noticing yeah. just the way that he lived. Well, and I think too, we live in a society and a culture where it is sexy to have like a wild story. Totally. And I say this as someone who has written a book with a wild <laughs> yeah. story, yeah. but it's almost like, um, and I think especially in our age of social media and maybe what I'm about to say is a hot take. Maybe it's not, I don't know. Um, but I've thought about this a lot lately where there's almost this, um, this mindset that like, if you don't have daddy issues or if you don't have mom issues, or if you don't, if you're not on, and I'm, and I really say this with like all compassion. Like if you, I have, I have all of these issues. So I say this as something, I feel like I have to give this caveat of like, I have dealt with anxiety. I have been to counseling, like all of these things, but it's almost like this. If you don't have those things, then what's wrong with you? Um, you know what I'm saying? And it's yeah. like, it's, and I, and I don't, I'm not saying that in a condemning way. I'm saying that in a genuine, like, okay, well, but then what does it look like to write a different story? Yeah. Like, I love my children and I want them to make mistakes and I want them to grow up. And because if you don't make mistakes, then you're not going to change. Like yeah. if you're, you know, and I, I tell this to my kids all the time, like, I want you to make mistakes, but I also like, I don't want them to then go into a, like, I want them to make mistakes now while they're in the security of like my home. Yeah, I don't want yeah. them going off to college and making the same mistakes I did, like that totally. are potentially life-changing and catastrophic. Um, what, what do I want more than I, what do I want for my children? I want them to be secure in their identity and who God created them to be. And I want them to be good friends and to be good stewards. And I want them to be good with their finances. And I want them to follow Jesus for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, I'm sure they'll end up in therapy about <laughs> something that I did over, you know, as a parent where I screwed up somewhere. But like, don't we want a, a better story for our kids? Like, don't yeah. we want a better story for other people? So I, I don't know. It's an interesting thing that I've just been thinking a lot about lately. And again, I fully say this as somebody yeah. who has written a book with a wild story. Um, <laughs> but I also think like, it's okay to want the story that's more similar to my husband's. Mm. Um, and that's not to say that he hasn't had hard times or struggles or anything like that. But like, when he goes through this, his things like his faith isn't wavered. It's mm -hmm. just not. Um, it's not, his faith is, is not, uh, circumstantial. Um, it is, it is just unwavering. Um, and that's what we want. That's what we want is yeah. when you do go through hard times, when you do go through suffering, your joy, uh, the source of your joy and your peace, like that's the whole, like Philippians, like a, mm -hmm. a peace that surpasses all understanding. So when yeah. the outside of the world looks at you and goes, but you're going through all these really hard things right now. Like, how do you still have peace? How do you still have joy? Mm. Well, <laughs> you know, so anyway, yeah. clear, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go a little ranty there, Maddie. No, I'm so listen, sorry. That, girl, that is the point of this whole show. It is. And you said on multiple occasions, in what you call your BC before Christ and after, and in this conversation, just yeah. that you grew up in your home and then in your relationship with the Lord later in life, knowing and living in the tension between joy and grief and yeah. like that joy and hardship. And I, I have felt that so deeply and I just, any opportunity we have to share another testimony of that being true in someone's life matters to me. Like that's yeah. where I want people to live. And that's why I appreciate your story so much. And just the fact that you show us these two pictures of like you living that that's true and John knowing that that's true. And like, mm -hmm. they're totally different stories, but the yep. place you get to with the Lord and that is the same. And just, you know, you said earlier, kind of at the beginning, I don't even remember in what context we were talking about it, but you just said, I hope people know that like nothing in their story is beyond redemption or something Correct. like that. And I feel like I've just, like, I want that to be what people see when they look at my life too. And that's part of why I wanted you here this week. Like this is Easter week. Like that's the point, right? Like it's obviously, mm -hmm. you know, spiritual, eventually physical, like resurrection, redemption, like that's, that's Easter, but also that every single thing that either breaks that's outside of our control or that we break ourselves, right? right. It, it got like, it's not beyond redemption. And, and I just wonder, like, especially with everything you went through losing your mom and just your story coming to faith later in life, like, does this week look different for you? Like, does it hold 
weight for you that it didn't used to. And it's fine if the answer isn't yes, but it just, for me, this week has meant Easter has meant something so much more profound than it used to. And I Mm. wonder if you feel that at all. Um, I'd say yes and no. Um, yes. In the sense that like, it's just, I have a hope of heaven that I just didn't have before. Um, and, um, and actually one of my favorite, I, I actually really love good Friday. Um, and maybe that's like dark, but, um, uh, I really love the good Friday story. Um, and there's actually, uh, one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible is in the good Friday story and it's in Luke 23, 42. Um, and it is in the conversation with Jesus and the thief on the cross. And that interaction is one of the most beautiful interactions in all of scripture to me personally. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, for this conversation between, uh, you know, a, a thief on his right and a thief on his left. And one of the thieves is mocking Jesus and is basically like on the cross too. And is like, uh, you know, well, if he's really God, like, can he just save himself? Like, come on, can he just get us down from like, he's like, my, he's dying. He's on a cross. Yeah. He's being crucified. And he's on a cross. And he's like, can't he just save himself? Meanwhile, this other thief turns to Jesus and like sees who Christ is in that moment. And he's on his like last few minutes of this time on earth. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Mm-hmm. And, um, and Jesus turns to that thief. And in the last like words of some of the last words he says, he says, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And that scripture is the most beautiful thing to me because like that wording too. Like Mm. you today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. Paradise. They are currently experienced. They are both naked and bloodied and they have nails in their wrists and their feet and they are dying from suffocation. Like when we actually sit and think about the brutality of crucifixion and the cross and what Jesus has experienced, And yet in this moment, Jesus looks at this man who is dying and says, like, I want to be with you, God. And Mm. in that moment, like Jesus could have said anything. He's like, you're going to be with me in paradise. The opposite of what they're experiencing in that moment. And if that is not the most beautiful picture of the gospel, I don't know what is. And so I just, I think about that all the time. Like Mm. that interaction just, I mean, it just frames, if we really believe that, I don't know how you can't walk this week unchanged. (laughs) Like, I don't know how you can't walk around life unchanged Um, to know that we have a God who in the depths of his most physical pain, um, spiritual pain, like he's experiencing pain that we will never comprehend um, that he has the compassion to look at somebody and say, you're going to be with me in paradise. Yeah. Like what a God. Oh, that is the Easter message. I love that you say that. I love that you share that story because you know, my book is called Lemons on Friday because of Good Friday as part of the metaphor, because I feel like that's so much of our life feels like Good Friday, right? A lot of life doesn't feel like he has risen on Instagram, Resurrection Sunday. Like there are often more of those valley moments of those dark days. And so to know that his promise, that his hope, like that his compassion and sacrifice and everything that he chose to endure for us like that was the day it happened like he chose it he went through it so that we don't have to and just like you said the dichotomy of that excruciating pain and aloneness against the fact that we never have to be excruciatingly alone from him is amazing you've have you seen the video of it's a scottish preacher i'll never remember his name but it's a message that he preaches on that passage um And if you Google it, literally Scottish preacher, the man on the middle cross said I could come, you will cry because I, if you haven't seen it. Okay. Well, I'm literally writing this down right now because I I wish I knew his name. That would be very helpful. Um, Scott, I'm writing this down. Scottish Scottish pastor. Um, And he tells this whole story about the scripture that you just walked us through. And it's essentially like that there's, you know, the, the, he goes to heaven, he dies that day, the thief. Um, he gets there and like, you know, whoever's at the gates of heaven, like checking the roll or whatever, yeah. he makes it pretty funny, you know, is asking him all these questions about why he's there. Like, 
do you know the doctrine of justification? Do you know this? Do you know this? And he's like, nope, nope, nope. Mm -hmm. Like, do you know Abraham and Isaac? Nope. Like, and so he kind of goes through this list and well, I guess now you don't need to watch it, but he goes through this list. Oh, I'm still watching it, Matt. And, uh, and he finally gets to the end and the angel or whoever is kind of like, well, do you know why you're here? And the thief, he, the guy just looks at him and he says, I, the guy on the middle cross said I could come. And it's just like, that's it. That's the whole mm. story. Like that's all that matters. Mm. And I don't, that it just, it is so moving to me. And mm. I feel like, like that was the story for him and it's the story for us. And it doesn't matter. Like if it's your last breath on the cross, it doesn't matter if, you know, you've hit all those rock bottoms and you caused right. them yourself. Like it doesn't right. matter. Like yeah. you said, nothing is beyond redemption. And like, not only does he do it, it's like, he doesn't give it to us with an eye roll. Like God, you did this again. He gives it to us like, mm. as he's bleeding out, this is my greatest joy that today you'll be with me in paradise. Like it's mm. amazing. Oh, so beautiful. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, as soon as we get off of here, <laughs> I'm going to go watch this. Everybody uh, goes that's so good. Oh, so good. Yeah. I mean, it really is. It's such a powerful, um, it's such a powerful testimony. It's such a powerful image. Yeah. Um, man, I love it. Well, I'm just so thankful for your joy, for your hope, um, Thank you. for your faith and your book. Gosh, y'all go order this today. I promise it is like perfect timing, obviously Easter week, but just coming up on spring and summer, it's like, I hope this is a compliment and doesn't diminish the power of your story, but like this is your beach read, man. Like the first, yes! whatever, 17 chapters, you're just like beach read, beach read. And then boom, gospel punch. Great. <laughs> yeah. So like punch in the face. Yeah, I love that it. You've been warned. So yeah. don't leave a mean Amazon review. Yeah. Um, but go get the book, follow your podcast. Can I, can I laugh on your shoulder and follow Molly? And also just as a sidebar, we're not going to go into, if anyone is interested in farming, you like live on an operating farm yeah so yeah yeah <laughs> right now as we are seeing here i can currently i just like had to glance my uh eyes over because my goats are now out and they're i think they're walking into my garage as we speak so oh, well, it's, it's fine it's, it's not un, go. <laughs> it, no it's fine it happens regularly but then sometimes i like i'm like what are y'all doing like <laughs> my goats will stand so like at my office door and they'll just stare at me while i'm recording <laughs> Yeah, as we all do, look at our goats out Naturally. our office door. Um, well, I've just had so much fun with you. I, I'm so this excited so that your story fun. is out there. Best, um, best day, way to spend, spend my day. We always close, which I feel like we've touched on a lot of joy, but by asking what's one thing that's bringing you joy right now? Mm. Um, oh, man, so many things. Um, I would say truly right now, uh, I love this time of the year on the farm. Um, because it's like, we're entering that time of the year where like some of the days it's like real beautiful outside, but it's like still, you know, as we're recording this, like it's still winter, mm -hmm. but like yesterday, uh, was my son's birthday and we, it was beautiful out. And so the kids just pl played outside for hours. Um, but we're planting seeds and we're ordering, you know, spring chickens and our goat mama is going to have babies in like a month or so. And so it's just like, there's that rebirth, um, mm -hmm. that time mm -hmm. on the farm. And there's just, uh, you know, all the things that were dead are now coming back to life. Mm -hmm. And I just love it. It's my favorite time of the year on the farm. Um, and so it's just, yeah, anytime I get up to just be outside and be with my animals or in the garden or whatever, um, I love it. I love that. I love that answer. Rebirth, redemption, yeah. and real Diet Coke. Yes. And Mountain episode. Diet <laughs> Coke is probably going to have to go to uh, actually fun thing. It's, uh, so um, I dedicated my book. Um, uh, I didn't have it in the advanced reader copy because I hadn't done the dedication yet because I felt so much pressure. I dedicated it to my dad. And then underneath of that, I kid you not, this is printed in the book. It says, to the guys who work at my local Circle K, thanks for making sure that the Diet Coke is always working for me. That is amazing. Yes, I di I dedicated my Incredible. actual book to the people who work at Circle K and make sure that the Diet <laughs> Coke is working. Shout out of their life. Shout that out is incredible. to Donnell and Donald at the Circle K on Highway 70 in Hillsborough, North Carolina. You are doing God's work, Donald. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> Donald's the man. Oh, man. Molly, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a wonderful Holy Week, Easter week. Congratulations on your book. It's great. I'm so thank glad. Thank you so, so much for having me, Maddie. This is an honor.